Hello, everybody. First of all, Happy New Year's Eve, as I know it is the last day of the year, so this also means that t today is also our last video of the year. So we're going to come in today, and for our final video of the year, I wanted to go ahead and we're going to do the fourth president. Now, after this video, we're going to kind of take a short break here for a little while from the presidents, and I want to hit two other topics that I haven't hit in my head right now that I do want to kind of discuss that will not be, well, one is somewhat related to what happened during the fourth president's term, but the other one is not related to American history at all. So I just wanted to go ahead and kind of take a break after this video and hit some other topics that are not about a president. So anyway, today we're going to go ahead and for our final video of the year, we're going to hit the fourth president of the United States here for our president's little series of videos. So that means our fourth president is none other. And this is probably not given that we've gone through the first three. I don't really think from here until Abraham Lincoln, you probably don't know very many of them. So our fourth president was James Madison. This is a little portrait of him on the little index cards we have. This is James Madison, our fourth president. James Madison was a Democratic Republican. He belonged to the same political party as Thomas Jefferson. He was actually a very extremely close friend of Thomas Jefferson's. They were colleagues for years, and he was actually a co-founder of the party along with Jefferson. So he's very much Jefferson's uh, right-hand man, to put it blankly. blankly. They definitely got along. They worked together on many points during their lives. He was definitely Jefferson's right-hand man. Now, Madison does have a distinction. He is among the founding fathers, and he is indeed important because he is commonly known as the father of the Constitution. When the Constitution was written at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, Madison was largely responsible for a large part of crafting that document. He was responsible for a lot of the input and the stuff that finally got written down in the final copy. So Madison had a very influential part in crafting the Constitution, and that is why we kind of call him the father of the Constitution. So today I wanted to go ahead and we're going to hit him. Now I got to go grab my notebook here. So we're just going to wait here just a, one second. I'm going to go ahead here and yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and grab it. So give me one second. All right, we got this taken care of. Notebook. I do apologize if my voice is a little bit, sounds a little deeper or strained today. I do have a small cold going on. It is not the corona. Just making that clear. It's not corona. It's just a cold. So I do apologize if my voice sounds a little bit different today. So anyway, we're going to go ahead here with James Madison. And to really go and start up with James Madison, we're going to go as we have in the other videos. We're going to kind of look at his path prior to him being president and add some background to the, to the individual. So James Madison was our fourth president. He was our president from 1809 to 1817. Now, we're going to go all the way back and start here and what led Madison to this important role in U.S. government. Now, Madison was born... On March 16th of 1751 in Port Conway, Virginia, at his father and mother's plantation of Montpelier. He was the eldest out of their 12 children. Now, Madison was very much your typical plantation son owner. He was raised by wealthy parents. 
he got he was used to the idea of slaves because his father had had them. He, the plantation I I remember right was a tobacco plantation. It was not cotton, and he grew up on this plantation. Had fun with his brothers and sisters. He he received very well education from his father since his family could afford it, and largely had your typical childhood that you could commonly kind of like Thomas Jefferson did on the plantation. I would say. At age 18, Madison left home. He left Montpelier and to attend New, New Jersey College, or the College of New Jersey. Now, today, it has been renamed as Princeton University. So, if you go to Princeton University or you know of that, that's the same college. It's just been a re, it's just been renamed in the year during the years that have come since. So, he at age 18, he went to the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton University, and he graduated from there in 1771. While he was at college, Madison learned Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and at the same time became very interested in political science, basically politics, to put it bluntly. Madison began his career shortly after leaving and graduating from college. He began his career in politics during the Revolution, and he was, in fact, probably one of the youngest revolutionaries during the Revolution. He was actually the youngest member of the Continental Congress. He was only, I think, well, how old would he have been here? I think he was in his 20s or early 30s. So he was actually the youngest member of the Continental Congress during the Revolution, in 1776, he attended the Virginia Constitution Convention, in which the state of Virginia, kind of after had declared independence, had kind of decided they were going to write a new state constitution that is not that is now independent of British rule. So Madison was very influential in getting Virginia a new constitution immediately after it declared that it would be an independent entity from Great Britain. Madison also served in the Continental Congress, as we said, he served in. The, in the Continental Congress, and then he went left the Continental Congress toward the end of the Revolution and served again in the Virginia Legislature from 1784 to 1786. It was during his politics years in the Continental Congress and in the Virginia Legislature that Madison became very he came to meet and became very close friends with Thomas Jefferson, who was a fellow Virginian and the author of the Declaration of Independence, and as we all know, he was also our third president, as we discussed in our last video. This is where he met Thomas Jefferson. It was because they were from the same state. They commonly were in the same political field. And he came to meet Thomas Jefferson, and they came to be very good friends. They were actually lifelong friends until Jefferson's death. Jefferson died before Madison did, because he was older. Not that that necessarily means anything. But anyway, he became very good friends with Thomas Jefferson during these years. And they came to be good friends partly because they shared a common political views and ideologies. In particular, Madison, like Jefferson, was a very stout believer in religious freedom, that government should not be able to dictate a religion, that everyone, no matter what their religion, should be able to freely practice it and wherever they live without fear of being persecuted by the government for what they practice. Madison was a very big believer in this, and so was Jefferson, so they kind of aligned on this political sphere, which helped them kind of become the good friends that they became. Madi Madison was a delegate at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, as we mentioned, and as we uh, mentioned previously, he was one of the most influential crafters of the Constitution. Between 1787 and 1788, following the uh, writing and creation of the Constitution and when they're seeking for ratification of it in order for it to go into effect, Madison was a primary author of the Federalist Papers alongside Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, which these papers were basically editorial articles that were published in newspapers and other things across the, colon across the 13 states. They weren't colonies anymore. And they really kind of try to rebuff claims that the government was going to be worse than the previous one that existed under the Articles of Confederation that would impede people's rights, that it would just not be a good idea. Madison's part in this, in the Federalist Papers, was really influential as the factor that he was able to argue successfully in his articles in the Federalist Papers that the Constitution was indeed the government that would establish the, it would establish the system of government that the United States needed to prosper, and that anyone who did not think so was in the wrong that it would be a disgrace not to adapt, adopt this kind of system of government. And Madison's work paid off. In the end, the Federalist Papers are credited with kind of swaying most of the states to 
officially ratify the Constitution. It is credited with the success of the ratification of the document by persuading people that this is what we need to do. And one quote I think that Madison put in there, and it's, a, it's not, it's a very simple quote, but it's very true. And it, I suppose it doesn't necessarily abide to the Constitution itself. It can mean to anything. But one of the things I remember most from reading about Madison and his Federalist Papers was that in one of his articles he had wrote that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Most people today, there is not most people, but there are some people today that you go out there and ask them, they think the government's overreaching. They think that we don't, we shouldn't have a government. What does it do for us? Well, it's true that at times we get ticked off with the government. We don't exactly understand why we even have it. But Madison points out very plainly that if we were all angels, we wouldn't even need it. But we're not angels, so we do need it. No person on this earth is perfect. Because if we were, we could all get along and not have a problem. This is why we have to have government, because no one's perfect. There's constantly conflicts. There's quarrels with people in society. And there needs to be some kind of regulating body to keep the peace. In 1789, Madison was elected to the House of Representatives following the adoption of the constitutional government that was established under the Constitution. He was elected to the newly established House of Representatives. And he was a major advocate for the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments that eventually got passed in 1791 that were added on. In 1794, he married 26-year-old widow Dolly Payne Todd. They had no children throughout their lifelong marriage until Madison died, before she did. and But they did have one adopted child that was Dolly's from her previous marriage. Now, may I keep you informed here that Dolly was 26 years old when she married James, and James was 43. There's a little bit of a difference here, people. I also want to point out there's a fun factor about James Madison. If you do not know this, he was actually our shortest president. James Madison was, if you stood him in a line of presidents by their height, literal physical height, he would be our shortest. He was only, if I remember, let me see, I've got it down here. I jot it down. Oh, where is it? Right here. James Madison was our shortest president. He only stood at five feet, four inches tall. To put that bluntly, he was shorter than me. Not that you've ever seen how tall I am, but I am almost six foot. I'm, I think I'm five nine, five ten. So he would have been shorter than me. I thought he's probably shorter than most people. Most people are at least around five and a half feet. On average. And so, so he marries Dolly in 1794. And she is probably one of the best companions for James. They are lifelong partners. They get along extremely well. And she kind of sets, when he becomes president, Dolly really sets the example of what we know as the modern first lady. She was really the first one to kind of implement a lot of the first lady roles and ceremonies and traditions that we commonly associate with the president's wife. She acted as a hostess to parties and events. And if you want a picture here, we have a small portrait of her. This was in her youth. This was Dolly. She is, when she was first lady, she is the one that, if you read about the War of 1812, she saved the one painting of George Washington inside the White House by having them rip it off the wall, take it out of the portrait frame, and roll it up and take it out of the White House before the British got there to burn it. She is also credited with being the one to start the White House Rose Garden. That was her garden originally that she created and started. In 1801, Madison inherited Montpelier, the place of his birth, and his old childhood home from his father when his father died, and it became his home for the rest of his life. During the 1790s, Madison had been a founder of the Democratic-Republican Party alongside Thomas Jefferson, and he was a staunch supporter of Jefferson due to their shared political ideologies and beliefs. And thus, when Jefferson became president in 1801, he asked Madison to be his Secretary of State, which Madison readily accepted. And, of course, during Jefferson's presidency, a large part of Madison's Secretary of State role was trying to keep the United States neutral while Europe broke out into the Napoleonic Wars between Napoleonic France under Napoleon Bonaparte and the coalition European powers led by Great Britain and Russia and the Ottoman Empire, partially. 
when Jeff's, let's see, in 1803, Madison was a party in the landmark Marbury versus Madison case in the Supreme Court. He was the defendant in this case. And Madison was involved in this case that is very influential in American history because it really it was the first time that the Supreme Court established the idea of judicial review. Basically, the idea that the Supreme Court has the right to look at any legislative act or law that has been passed. And if it judges that there is a part of that law that violates any provision in the Constitution, basically any part of that law or act or even the whole thing, if there's any bit of it that goes against what the Constitution says someone has the power to do, the Supreme Court has the authority that it can label that to be an unconstitutional law and nullify it. Until then, this was not really defined or clear. Now, that is going to be one of our two topic videos that I want to kind of talk about more. So that will be one of our coming ones here for the first two that we're going to do here in 2021. So I just wanted to not really hit a lot on that right now just kind of established the big thing that it, it, it kind of established because we're going to go more into detail about that case. I'm going to do a separate video on it because it really is important because it's really when we think of the Supreme Court today, it's one of the most common things we'll think about that the Supreme Court has the power to declare a law unconstitutional. Well, until 1803, this was not exactly clear or really absolutely sure that the Supreme Court could do this. And it's a very important factor in the modern American judicial system. At the end of Jefferson's two terms, and remember Jefferson Rant, he left office in 1809. So this comes in 1808, there's going to be a presidential election because Jefferson's choosing not to run for a third. Madison decided he was going to run for the presidency in 1808, and of course he had Jefferson's backing. Jefferson viewed that Madison would continue his policies, he was his right-hand man, and he would continue to keep the Federalists, who were the very strong people on the other side of the political field, which included John Adams, that they wanted a strong centralized government where the Democratic Republicans said that they should be a strong centralized government and that should, more power should be reserved to the states alone. Madison was, in Jefferson's eye, the perfect candidate to continue his legacy, to continue the work of, the Republic of Democratic Republicans or Republicans, as they were simply called back in the day. And of course, he had Jefferson's backing in the 1808 election, and Madison easily won election in 1808. He defeated Federalist Charles Pickney of South Carolina by an electoral vote count of 122 to 47 in the Electoral College. Madison also managed to secure 64.7% of the popular vote in the 1808 election. It was probably one of the easiest elections that a presidential candidate has had. In case you want to see the electoral map, as we always have, right here is the electoral map of the 1808 presidential election. The green states are what Madison won, and the orange is what the Federalist Charles Pickney won. Now, keep in mind that the Federalist Party is kind of no longer going to be in power, and by the end of Madison's two terms, they will actually kind of just be ex almost extinct as an entity. By the early 1820s, the Federalist Party was dead. It was extinct. It was done. But at this time, they're still holding on, and their main basin of power was in New England. This would be where the last big Federalist holdout was, and the nation was in the New England area. But other than that, they really didn't have much. So Madison is elected as our fourth president in 1808, and he takes office in March of 1809. Now, immediately after he is elected, within weeks, he repeals the Embargo Act of 1807 that Jefferson had passed that kind of restricted trade be between the United States, Great Britain, and France to try to coax Britain and France to kind of respect American neutrality rights on the high seas, even though they were at war with each other. Madison realized this Embargo Act was hurting the American economy more than it was helping it. And he immediately went ahead and decided that I will repeal this, even though Jefferson passed it. I do deem it's probably not the best idea. So within a few weeks of his presidency, of him assuming office, he does one of his first big acts, and that was abolishing this Embargo Act, but also passing this one order that he sent to Britain and France saying that if any one of those nations agrees to halt hostilities 
and impressment practices on the high seas and harassing of American shipping, whichever power does that first, I will immediately impose trade restrictions on the other. Basically saying, if you help me, I'll help you. But who's going to come to the table first? Of course, Napoleon went all for it. Kind of lied to the United States saying, oh yeah, sure, I'll stop, I'll stop. So, of course, Madison went ahead, signed the bill, said, okay, trade restriction on Great Britain. Well, Napoleon went back on his word and never actually did it, so it was kind of a flop. <laughs> so, as we go on here, Madison, one of the few things that he was able to really do in his first term was he, try, he wanted to try to slightly expand the United States' territory, and in 18, 1810 he did this by occupying the Spanish ter territory of West Florida. Now, you might ask me, what is West Florida? Well, if we look back here at this map of the 1808 election, and it kind of shows some territories here that the United States claimed at the time. The light gray are territories that the United States claimed. The dark gray is territories that we actually own at that time. So these areas are claimed, but they're disputed. West Florida was this area right here, the southern part of Alabama and Mississippi. This over here would be Spanish Florida, but this was called Spanish West Florida. And J Madison claimed that that was United States territory. So in 1810, he urged the governor of the Mississippi Territory to send troops down and occupy that territory, and he did. It was not officially recognized by Spain, though, until 1819, but Spain really didn't retaliate against it. Now, unfortunately for Madison, he, although he had hoped to continue a lot of Jefferson's policies as president, he wasn't really able to right off the bat, and he eventually wasn't able to do that much at all because of one problem. His term became very enveloped, enveloped and kind of consumed by one event in particular, and that was hostilities with Great Britain. And it really defined his two terms, especially his sec first and the, the latter half of his first and the beginning of his second. Now, Great Britain and France had been at war since 1799, when they had kind of gone to war after, when France was still in its revolutionary stage. They reignited the war in the early 1800s, when Napoleon had come to power and crowned himself as French Emperor, and the Napoleonic Wars are raging on in Europe between Napoleon and the coalition powers. Now, Britain and France both tried to coerce the United States to their side. They were trying to attack American merchant shipping, trying to kind of harass the United States to pick a side. The United States was trying to stay neutral in the conflict as it didn't want to get involved. And Britain in particular was not only harassing American merchant, ship merchant shipping, but it was sometimes sinking American ships. And at other times, it was also going ahead and stopping American ships and getting on board these ships with Royal Navy. Royal Navy British ships would board American merchant vessels, claim that there were some British deserters, on these ships, even though most of the time there were not British deserters. A couple times there were, but most of the time these were American citizens. But Britain claimed they were British Royal Navy deserters and would take and kid basically kidnap these men and force them to serve in the Royal Navy. Basically trying to refill their ranks with sailors because they couldn't get any at home. This was taking the United States off greatly, plus the continued attacking on American trading rights and merchantmen. And Madison tried to negotiate a peaceful solution to these kind of hostilities and attacks with Great Britain. Unfortunately, he could not come to an official agreement, and he could not reach an, a very suitable peace agreement with Great Britain over these issues. And Madison eventually came to resign to himself. He started to listen to war hawks in Congress that stated, we need to go to war with Great Britain. They're, they're not going to listen to us. Madison was very hesitant. But eventually he resigned that war was unfortunately becoming quite necessary and was basically unavoidable at this point. So in June of 1812, Madison asked Congress to declare war on Great Britain. And this did happen. It was the sm slimmest margin vote that we've ever had to declare war, but it was declared. Congress did declare war in June of 1812, and we went to war with Great Britain for the second time. 
Now, the war was probably not the best thing to do, given the factor that Britain had been fighting a war for years. At the time, they were still the world's greatest superpower, pretty much, on the, glo on the global scale. And the United States really was not prepared for a war. It was too young. Its army was too small. It hadn't really had much of a navy. It really was not prepared to go to war. Americans quickly jumped at the chance that they thought they could conquer British Canada in the north. Unfortunately, that did not really happen, and it just kind of backfired on them. They kind of got pushed back, but then Britain couldn't really get a foothold here either. So the war kind of drug on for about two years. Now, during the war, Madison was re-elected in 1812 by a very easy margin. He was re-elected, let me see here. In 1812, he was re-elected by a margin of 128 electoral votes to 89. This is a map of the 1812 election that happened in November, after the war had been declared, but before most of the fighting had really taken place. By this point, Louisiana was also a state. And just give me a second here. I do have a map I drew back a while ago of the War of 1812 because we did a video on it. That's why I really am not going into a lot of the details here because I did a video on it once. And if you want to check that out, I will provide the little suggestion for it at the end of the video. So let me grab my map over here that I kind of drew from the map site. This kind of shows the battle sites of the War of 1812 as it happened. It was really the first time the United States had been at war since the American Revolution, and Madison really got a lot of the blame for it. Don't know how well this is going to show up, but this is just like the map of the United States at the time. It was a British naval blockade down here. We had to, most of the battles were up here in the, along the Canadian border and the Great Lakes area. You also had, toward the end of the war, you had the battle down here at New Orleans that actually took place quickly after the end of the war. But news traveled slow at the time, so they didn't get the news that the war was over until after the battle had already been fought. So, anyway, Madison. The war was about two years long, and it wasn't widely supported by everybody. People in the West and the South were very keen to support the war, but people in New England and the Northeast, where the Federalists still kind of had their stronghold, they were very much kind of iffy, and they didn't really like the idea of the war because they depended a lot on tr sea trade. And with the British blockade, that was becoming kind of almost an impossibility. The Federalists were very anti-war during this time period. They did not trust the war. They were not very much for it. They opposed it. And many of the Federalists kind of viewed Madison as weak. They called him a weak pacifist who had kind of given in to the demands of a, a war hawk Congress. And they began referring to the war as Mr. Madison's War. Now today we know it as the War of 1812. Now the Federalists in New England in particular, they got so fed up with the war, with the war that A, they refused to even, in states that had Federalist uh, politicians kind of in control, they refused to let their state militias be used for a Canadian invasion. They refused to let their militias be used for anything other than defense of the state. So this kind of set back some of the war efforts into Canada. It also hurt the United States when in about 1814, they had the Federalists in New England in, met in Hartford, Connecticut to have what was called the Hartford Convention. And they basically kind of pondered the idea of seceding from the United States from breaking away and form their own country because they did not approve of the war. They thought it was wrecking their economy and their way of life, and they deemed, we just need to break away. The government's not listening to our interests anymore. Now, this never really did come to fruition at all, not like the Civil War. This was never really came to fruition. It was simply suggested, but it was never acted upon. And after the war, it kind of hurt the Federalists because people learned about this, and you know, like, they came to view the Federalists as somewhat traitors for having to even suggested the notion that they break away and form their own country. So they kind of expelled part of the end of the Federalist Party because after the war, people kind of viewed the Federalists as traitors. They were unpatriotic, and they had kind of betrayed the country when it needed it most. 
Many Americans came to view the war as a second war of independence to try to re to try to confirm America's rights and its independence in the Western Hemisphere from Great Britain. And for this part, it did enjoy some popular a large majority of popularity outside of the Federalist fold. Now, for the first two years of the war, for the first year of the war, it somewhat kind of was a tie. In 1813, there was a couple of major victories for the United States, mostly at the battles of Lake Erie and the Battle of the Thames in Canada, and the Battle of Lake Erie in uh, Putten Bay, Ohio, where I live. I don't live in Putten Bay, but I live here in Ohio. And then, of course, the Battle of New Orleans at the very end of the war kind of gave this sense that even though the United States had really not, no one had really won the war, it ended on kind of a tie with the signing of the Treaty of Ghent in 1814 in Belgium. But war. In early 1815, in January, before the news of that treaty could get over here, because the treaty wasn't signed till Christmas Eve of 1814, and then it took time to get back over here. In early January of 1815, there was a final battle on New Orleans when the British tried to take that city in Louisiana, and Americans and pirates and Indians kind of defended the thing, kind of defended the city with the help of American General Andrew Jackson, who would later become our seventh president. And they defended the city, and it was a splendid defense, and it crushed the British little invasion there. And after the war, even though Americans had kind of come away with a draw, they hadn't gained nothing, but they hadn't lost nothing, many Americans viewed it as a victory because, A, we hadn't really lost nothing, but at the same time, they felt empowered because even though we supposedly were bad during the war, we managed to score some major victories during it. We managed to win the Battle of Lake Erie. We managed to win the Battle of the Thames, and we did kick the British at New Orleans. So there was a sense that even though we'd lost, we won as well. So the war comes to an end, in eight, technically in at the end of 1814, but it really didn't end until 1815, when the fighting finally stopped and news got around that the war was over. And when the war is over, the Federalists kind of lose their power that they have remaining in their hands, and Madison becomes hugely popular. Now, during the war, it is a sad marker to say that in August August of 1814, the British did burn the capital of Washington, D.C. They invaded it and did burn it, and the White House was burned as well. Madison was not home at that time. He was actually personally leading troops out in Maryland at the time, so he was not in Washington, D.C. when the British invaded. And after they burned Washington, D.C., they went to Fort McHenry trying to take Baltimore, Maryland, and that... They failed to take that, and then they retreated. It was during that battle that the Star-Spangled Banner was written. So anyway, the war ends in late 1814, and Madison is kind of hailed as the champion of the victors because he proved that even during wartime, we need to have adhere to the Republican principles of government. We cannot fall into fray, even if we're during even in a war. We cannot let the democratic process fall through. We still need to respect our laws and our lands, and we need to respect traditions as well. He kind of established that even during war, the United States government was going to be able to function. Madison, during his final presidential years, pr between 1815 and 1817, he largely focused on trying to rebuild the economy that had been devastated Prior to the war, and especially during the war, he tried to rebuild America's economy, and it was largely successful. He, During his final two years in office, he desired to rebuild it by accomplishing and implementing several things. He implemented new tariffs by protecting American goods, by raising taxes on imported goods that were from other countries. That way, people would be encouraged that if you want the cheaper good, you'll buy an American good. So he raised, he implements some new tariffs. He advocates internal improvements to the country, such as the building of roads and railroads and canals. Not that railroads were really there yet, but mostly roads and canals. He also went ahead and established a second national bank to help with the country's finances. With it for, and the second national bank was established with a 25-year charter. And this, he also decided that we need to have a stronger navy and an army because he had learned from the war of 1812 that we had not been prepared and he decided okay so we're going to expand the army and navy as well 
So during his last two years, Madison really tried to accomplish some kind of rebuilding of the country, and he largely succeeded and ushered in what we now know as the era of good feelings, which we'll discuss more when we hit the fifth president, James Monroe. Madison, during his t two terms, saw the admission of two new states to the Union. He saw the admission of Louisiana on April 30th of 1812, and just before he left office in 1817, he saw the admission of Indiana on December 11th of 1816. Madison left office in 1817 after serving two terms. He re remained a highly respected and active figure in civic causes. He didn't really shy away from it, even after he was kind of retired. And he was still friends with Thomas Jefferson, and he helped him when he could. And in 1826, when Thomas Jefferson died that year on July 4th, remember, remember that Thomas Jefferson had formed the university, kind of created the University of Virginia. That was kind of his academic village, as you will. And when Jefferson died in 1826, Madison was at Jefferson's funeral, and shortly after, the University of Virginia asked him to act as their rector, basically their kind of supreme head, as you will, the space that Jefferson kind of had. They kind of honored Jefferson since he had been a good friend and they knew he was similar, and Madison readily accepted. He acted as the rector of the University of Virginia after 1826. James Madison eventually died at his home on Mont at Montpelier on June 28th of 1836. He was aged 85, and he died from heart failure. His wife, Dolly, would survive him by a couple more years. She would live until 1849. <coughs> oh, dear. Excuse me. So that largely, I think, covers James Madison. I... The reason that he might seem that shorter than most presidents here, in at least terms of length here, is because of the factor that most of his presidency was kind of consumed by the war, and I already kind of did a video on that, so I really didn't want to have to go through all that again, when I've already done it once. So we didn't kind of skip the war, and that since that was such a large part of Madison's presidency, that is why we don't seem to have talked a whole lot today about what actually happened during his presidency. So if you want to read about, learn about the War of 1812, I will provide the little suggestion in the, at the end of this video for that video that I did back in the summer or fall. I forget which one it was. I think it was August or September I did it. But anyway, I will go ahead and give you that suggestion. That way you can watch it if you wish to, since it was the major event during, during James Madison's presidency that really defined most of it. So... That concludes our video today for James Madison, who was our fourth president. If you need another look at him, this is him, the father of our Constitution, and very much a influential figure. So that is him. This concludes our fourth video in the President series. As I mentioned, our next two videos are going to kind of divulge a little bit. I will not say what the second one what is, but we are, as we mentioned, we are going to do one on the Marbury versus Madison case of 1803, which I feel is important to kind of discuss as it kind of establishes judicial review in the United States. So we will hit those. Uh, let's see. Other than that, I don't really think I have much to say. So this is our last video of the year. So we've made it through 2020. Hopefully this coming year is much better. I hope. I know this year was not exactly the bomb. <laughs> it was probably a bomb. <laughs> so hopefully it's much better. So that will conclude our video for today. So as always, if you like the video, if you like any of the videos that are coming out, be sure to comment on them. Be sure to put the thumbs up button, whatever. Do all the usual. Uh, suggest any ideas to me in the comment section on any of the videos. If you have any in your head that you would like me to do, I will grad gladly do them at any time. So, as always, just the usual. So, that concludes our video for today. Hopefully, everyone has a wonderful and safe New Year's Eve. Please don't do anything stupid. <laughs> and by stupid, I mean usual stuff that we would usually do on New Year's Eve, because if you're doing all that stuff, and I understand if it's with a small group of people, but if it's with a bunch and it's your usual big old full-blown extravaganza, well, you're probably inviting something bad to happen right now. So please be careful if you're planning to do something like that. Take precautions. 
So anyway, have a happy New Year's Eve, have a happy New Year's, and we will see you back here next week for our first video of 2021. May God bless you all, and may God give you all a happy and wonderful New Year.